Today we'll be talking about microcirculation. Our learning objectives is to recognize the structural components of microcirculation, describe the ultrastructure of the capillary and how it relates to the function, explain what is Laplace law and how it applies to the capillary, explain the importance of microcirculation, explain the starling forces and how it governs the transport across the capillary, describe the lymphatic system and state its function, explain the clinical application of starling forces. To start with, we have to know that the microcirculation goes through the microcirculatory unit. So what is the microcirculatory unit? The microcirculatory unit is formed of arterioles, mid-arterioles, capillary bed, venules. Note the presence of the precapillary sphincter. This pre-capillary sphincter can regulate the function of the capillary bed in accordance with the metabolic need of the tissue at any particular time. And this regulation is carried out by the locally derived metabolic factors. It's important to know that the microcirculatory unit is a highly specialized structure for the exchange between the blood and the tissue. It's characterized by having a thin wall representing a very small diffusion barrier and it has a big surface area in relation to the volume ratio which also provides an effective exchange site. Note that not all the capillary beds are open at the same time. Going through the ultrastructure of the capillary it concerns the histology more than us in the physiology, but for the physiology, what is important for us is to know that the capillary has a very small diameter and it's made up of two endothelial cells forming a very small cylinder. The clift or the channels observed in the drawing are related to the capillary function. And we have different types of capillaries. Continuous capillaries where there is no clifts or channels you can find this in the brain or sometimes you have clifts only which is present in the muscle fenestrated capillary it has clifts and channels and you can find it in the small intestine this continuous capillary where it has clifts and big channels you can find it in the liver this is just to go through the microstructure of the capillary And this is just to give you examples of the different types of capillaries according to the structure and the site of presence in the body. Flow of blood and capillaries. It's characterized by being very slow, ranges between 0.5 to 1 mm per second due to the large total cross-sectional area of the capillary bed which will give enough time for the exchange of material between the blood and the interstitial fluid. It's also intermittent due to the vasomotion. What is this vasomotion? It's an alternating contraction and relaxation of the mid-arterioles and precapillary sphincter in response to the metabolite. So in cases of lack of oxygen, excess carbon dioxide, excess lactic acid, potassium ion, all these act as a trigger to relax the precapillary sphincter and the mid-arterioles. If we want to apply this in the tissue in the two state, in the resting state, you'll find that most of the capillary are closed and the blood flow through them is fair enough. Then there is cellular respiration accompanied by accumulation of the metabolite, excess carbon dioxide, for example, and lack of oxygen which will t trigger relaxation of the mid-arterioles and precapillary sphincter. So more capillaries will open, more blood flow through the capillary. This will watch the metabolites, leading to constriction of the mid-arterioles and precapillary sphincter, and the cycle repeats itself. It repeats itself in a range between 6 to 12 times per minute. While in the active tissue, just like an uh, active exercising uh, muscle. There is accumulation of the metabolite, lactic acid, excess CO2, lack of oxygen, which will open large number of the capillary, and uh, there is rapid vasomotion cycle. Also, it's important to know the capillary pressure. 
The pressure in the human nail bed capillaries 35 millimeter mercury at the arterial end and 12 millimeter mercury at the venous end. It's not the same in different parts of the body. The thin capillary wall can withstand high pressure and this is explained by the Laplace law which state that the tension equals pressure times the radius. So the very small capillary radius prevent marked increase in the wall tension even with a considerable increase in the pressure. But sometimes the capillary wall will be fragile, easy to rupture in cases of old age, some allergic condition, and vitamin C deficiency, ascorbic acid deficiency, which is the scurvy, which will lead to failure of the endothelial cell to be cemented together. What is the importance of the microcirculation? The importance of the microcirculation is it's the site of the transport of the nutrient to the tissue and removal of the metabolic waste product. Number one, it's done by the diffusion or by the transcapillary filtration, the bulk flow, which is regulated by the starling forces, by the diabetes, by the vesicular transport. So we have four ways of exchange of material between the blood and the interstitial fluid, either done by diffusion, transcapillary filtration, diabetes movement, and vesicular transport. Starting with the diffusion, it's an important mechanism for the exchange across the capillary wall. The rate of the diffusion depends on the capillary permeability, which depends on the types of the capillary, and it depends also on factor related to the substance, which is the concentration gradient. The more the concentration gradient, the more the rate of diffusion, so it's di directly proportion. The lipid solubility, the more the lipid soluble, the more the rate of the diffusion of the substance. The molecular size, the smaller the size of the water soluble substance, the more its rate of diffusion. Then we have the starling forces, which control and regulate the transcapillary filtration, or what is known as the bulk flow. It depends on certain factors or forces that control and regulate the exchange of substance across the capillary membrane. We have certain forces or factors that tend to move the fluid out of the capillary to the interstitial space. These factors are the capillary hydrostatic pressure and the interstitial colloidal osmotic pressure. When we have a colloidal osmotic pressure, this pressure tends to suck the fluid towards it. If it's present outside in the interstitial space, this means it's sucking from the capillary side to the interstitial space. So both the capillary hydrostatic pressure and the interstitial colloidal osmotic pressure act as filtrating force. While the other two forces are the interstitial hydrostatic pressure and the capillary colloidal osmotic pressure. These are forces or factors tend to move the fluid towards the blood. So it moves inward from the interstitial space to the capillary. What do we have here? We have the capillary colloidal osmotic pressure. We have plasma protein inside the capillary. They have a colloidal osmotic pressure and then they tend to suck the fluid toward them. So they are one of the suction force. The interstitial hydrostatic pressure, it tends to push away from it, uh, to push away from it, to push from the interstitial space to the blood. So it is a pushing force towards the blood. So now as if we have filtrating forces and Absorbing forces. Filtrating forces, the capillary hydrostatic pressure and the interstitial colloidal osmotic pressure. The absorbing forces, the interstitial hydrostatic pressure and the capillary colloidal osmotic pressure. Definitely, at the arterial side of the microcirculatory unit, there is high filtrating force, while at the venous side, we will have high absorbing force. And there is an equation that control or govern the fluid movement, it states that there is a constant multiplied by 
the filtration forces minus the absorbing forces. What is this constant? The constant is known as capillary filtration coefficient, which is proportionate to the permeability of the capillary and the surface area of the capillary. If you want to apply the starling forces along the muscle capillary to see the net force, it will be the following. At the arterial side, the filtration force minus the absorbing force will give us 11 mm mercury. This means the fluid moves out from the capillary into the interstitial space under a force of 11 mm mercury. At the venular side, the filtration force minus the absorbing force will give us negative 9 mm mercury. This means that the fluid moves into the capillary from the interstitial space under a force of 9 mm mercury, which will bring us to the important question. Does all the fluid that filtered from the arterial side and the capillary will be absorbed at the venous side? The answer is 85% of what has been filtered in the arterial side of the capillary will be absorbed at the venous side of the capillary. So what about the 15% remaining? It will be returning to the circulation through the lymphatic system. This is to say that we have 24 liters of fluid filtered through the capillary per day, which represent 0.3% of our cardiac output. 85% of the filtered fluid is reabsorbed into the capillary. 15% returns to the circulation via the lymphatic system. Coming to the third mechanism of exchange along the capillary membrane, which is the diabetes, it's seen by some types of leukocytes that can squeeze themselves to pass into the interstitial space. Attracted by the release of certain chemicals, this is known as positive chemotaxic effect, which has been explained earlier in the blood. The fourth mechanism of transport across the capillary wall is the vesicular transport which is done for the large lipid insoluble molecules. The protein, for example, are transported across the endothelial cell by this mechanism to be engulfed in by the endocytosis and in pushed out by the exocytosis. And also it has been discussed last year. What is next? We should know that the net filtration minus the net absorption will give us the net outflow and about 2 liters per day are collected by the lymph vessel because we said that what is being filtered from the arterial side is not completely absorbed by the venous side only 85 is absorbed by the circulation through the veins and the remaining 15% will go through the lymphatic system it's important to note that the fluid that is filtered through the capillary wall to the interstitial space plus the fluid produced by the tissue cannot be completely returned to the vascular compartment by the same capillary to maintain the fluid balance in the tissue. Most of this work is done or carried out by the lymphatic system. The total lymph flow is about 120 milliliter per hour. The lymph flow increased by... Let's reflect on the starling forces the lymph flow will increase by increasing the capillary hydrostatic pressure it makes sense it's a filtrating force increasing the capillary surface area definitely if you increase the capillary surface area you're increasing the filtration increasing the capillary permeability the more the capillary permeability the more the filtration the more the lymphatic flow Increasing the tissue metabolism, yes. Increasing the muscle activity, and these two factors control and regulate the precapillary sphincter activity and the mid arterioles. So, what is the for the clinical application of today's session? We'll talk about the clinical application of the starling forces, which is the edema. What is edema? Edema is an abnormal large accumulation of the interstitial fluid and because of the gravity the interstitial fluid tends to accumulate in the dependent parts, our lower limbs in the standing position and in our back 
in the recumbent position. What could be the causes of edema? Reflecting the causes of edema to the starling forces, the first factor that may cause an edema is the presence of increased filtration pressure. You can see this in increased total extracellular fluid volume, incompetence in the venous valve, or if there is venous obstruction, or if there is heart failure. The other cause, there may be decrease in the osmotic pressure of the capillary. You can see this in decreased plasma protein level, in nutritional edema, in liver cirrhosis, in kidney diseases as nephrosis. The third cause, it may be increased capillary permeability, and it's not only dependent on the types of capillary, we have certain chemical substances that may increase the capillary permeability, such as histamine, kinine, substance B. The fourth cause that may lead to edema, or play an important role in the edema, is the inadequate lymph flow. can be seen in cases of lymphatic obstruction, such as elephantiasis, where there is high protein content fluid due to inflammation, fibrosis of the interstitial fluid, and we will have this type of edema in the elephantiasis, which is non-bitting edema. It could be unilateral or bilateral. Now we want to emphasize on the fact that we have starling forces. These forces are very important to control and regulate the bulk flow and that the arterial side of the capillary bed is the filtrating side while the venous side is the absorbing side keeping in mind that 85% of what has been filtered is absorbed back while the 15% will go back to the circulation through the lymphatic system. By this we finish today's session. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.